Well, good morning again. What a blessing to be here with you. Uh, a new opportunity to share the Word of God with you. Um, as you know, Pastor Philip and, uh, is taking a team to um, Kentucky to see uh, the uh, art, Ark Encounter. That's how it's called, right? So why don't we pray for them, okay? I know they were flying this morning and they're going to have a great time, but let's pray for them and let's pray for us. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, for this gathering. Lord, we are gather here in your name. As your word tells us, Lord, that you are here because you, whatever there is two or more, you're in the midst of them, Lord. So, Father, we don't want to be ignorant of that. We want to acknowledge your presence. And, Lord, um, bring us to a place of humility. And, Jesus, uh, we want to open our hearts to you this morning. And we pray, Lord, that uh, your, your voice, your word might be heard and received in our hearts. Lord Jesus, at the same time, we pray for um, the group that is in um, Kentucky right now, Lord, or maybe flying over there. Father, will you protect them and would you speak to them, Lord? Uh, we pray that they will have a great time in learning more and expanding their knowledge, Lord, as they visit the ark. Uh, Jesus, thank you for us here. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will be the helper and the teacher and Help us, Lord, to understand the story that we're going to see this morning and apply it to our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 So last week that I, uh, well, the week before that I was here with you guys, I spoke on John chapter 6. Uh, this morning we're going to speak on John chapter 5. So I'm going backwards. Is that okay? Or <laughs> You know, when it's, when the first time that I began to read the Bible and, you know, came to church and somebody gave me a Bible and they said, read the Bible. And, and I open my Bible in the, in the Gospel of John. That's what the counselors, they tell you for the most part, read John. So I went to John, and, but I was puzzled by, why do I have to start with a book in the middle? You know, I didn't know the Bible. So I said, no, I'm going to go to the beginning. So I went to the book of Genesis, and I got lost. I was like, I don't understand anything. So I said, I have an idea. I'm going to go to the last page. I'm going to see what's going on at the end. <laughs> Even more lost, you know. <laughs> I'm still lost, but God is gracious. So we're going to go to John chapter 5. Uh, the week before when I was here and we were looking at John chapter um, 6, uh, we saw um, a very important moment in the ministry of Jesus. There was a change, you remember. Uh, Jesus was being followed by big crowds of people, multitudes of people. Jesus was walking around uh, the Sea of Galilee and doing miracles and performing miracles and signs and feeding people and healing and casting demons, doing all kinds of amazing stuff. And people were very excited, crowds from Judea, and of course, Galilee, you know, they were following Jesus. Uh, but then Jesus began to speak things that they were hard to be heard and to be accepted. And there he realized that there was a demand on them. It's not just the blessings, you know, that they could enjoy by following Jesus. But Jesus was challenging them to believe in him for who he claimed to be, the son of God. He said, I've been sent by the father and I'm the bread of heaven, the king sent by the father. And he spoke about his his flesh and his blood and foretelling us about the sacrifice, his sacrifice on the cross. And all this kind of like, you know, caused uh, many of them to, to say, no, we cannot believe that. You know, we like you. We want you, to, we want you to be our king and help us here on this earth. That's it. But we don't want you to be God. That's not. And, and a lot of people turned their back to Jesus and they left. And then Jesus, remember, he turned to his disciples and he said, you also want to leave? You're welcome to leave, but the disciples, especially Peter and the rest, they said, where are we going to go? You only have words of eternal life. Okay, so, so that, that was chapter 6. Now, in chapter 5 and the chapters before, we see some of the things that Jesus was doing before this. And I think it's important. And the story that we're going to see this, mo this morning, I think is hopefully will touch our hearts because this is what Jesus does. Okay, so let's go to chapter 5. And read from it. He says this. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called 
in Hebrew, Bethesda, having five porches. In this lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who he was. For Jesus has withdrawn and a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sing no more, lest the word things come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who has made him well. What a story, right? You are familiar with the story, probably. As I was meditating on the power and the love and the mercy of Jesus here in the story, um, you know, John is one of the Gospels, or maybe the only Gospel, that tells us exactly the reason why it was written. If you look real quick in John chapter 20, and uh, I can read it to you, maybe you're going to have that on the screen, but chapter 20 and verse uh, 31 says this, But this are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Let me say that again. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of John writing these stories. The verse before tells us that he did many other things. These are not the only things that Jesus did. He did many other healings, probably many other towns that are not recorded in the scriptures were visited by Jesus. But the things that are written here basically is that we might believe who Jesus claimed to be, the Son of God. And by believing in that, which, of course, it has to be with not just the person of Jesus, but, but what he did on the cross for us, dying on the cross, paying for our sins. By believing in Jesus, who rose again from the death, you may have life, and not just physical life, but a life that transcends this world into eternity. So that's the reason why John wrote all the things. And, and I think it's very important to keep that in mind when we read these stories. This is a story of healing, right? Um, and it's an amazing story that we're going to see today. But it's also a story of truth. It's also a story of truth. And it's very important to see through the text. So we're going to dive into the story, OK? So chapter 5, verse 1, we just read uh, the whole um, passage. But here, basically, we have a man, the story of a man who is totally powerless. And he's going to meet one who has all the power of the universe in the story. Uh, in one hand, we're going to have this man that is totally helpless and hopeless. And he's going to meet the one who is the helper. Well, the ultimate helper. I don't know anybody else that can help like Jesus. <laughs> and there is a man that has no strength at all. And he's going to meet the one that has all the strength of the universe. It's a very intriguing story. A very dramatic too. You know, when I was a kid, 
Uh, my mom, we were raised by, by my mom, uh, four of us, and I remember my mom coming into our rooms and saying, there was a popular saying in, in, in Peru where I grew up, maybe in Mexico and other countries. I will say it in Spanish, okay? If you, if you recognize it, you say, si, sí, okay? Okay, it's, it goes like this. Al que madruga, Dios le ayuda. Si. Sí. Not even my wife is saying si. Sí. Oh, come on. <laughs> Al que madruga, Dios le ayuda. Si, sí. okay. You know what it means? It basically it means God helps the early riser. Or those who rise early. Okay, and my mom will use that saying all the time to try to get us off bed to send us to school, right? <laughs> and I will tell my mom, Mom, I, I know he's going to help us, but can, can he help me later, you know, during school? <laughs> Not right now. So those sayings, you know, uh, yeah. And, and we have a saying here too, you know, you, you think about it. God helps those who help themselves. And these are great sayings, and they have a little bit of truth. But the story that we are reading is not about that. It's about... God helping somebody that cannot help himself. And that's what Jesus did when he came to this world. We couldn't help ourselves. And he has to come and do the things that we couldn't do. Pay for our sins. So a very, very, uh, uh, there's a lot of insights on, into this story. Verse 1 and 2 gives us kind of like the background of the story. We're going to see the occasion and the location um, of the events. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. So we know that it was a feast in Jerusalem. We don't know what feast was that. Probably the Feast of the Tabernacles, Pentecost, Passover. We don't know the feast. It's not important for the story itself. But a lot of the uh, 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 Jews' males, the Jewish males, they will come into Jerusalem for this festivity. So the city was packed with people, maybe 10 more times the usual population. And Jesus goes into Jerusalem, I don't think it's because of a coincidence or he didn't have anything to do and he says, you know what I'm going to do today? Oh, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. No, that's not Jesus. <laughs> that's us, right? But Jesus always knows what he's going to do. So he goes into uh, Jerusalem because he's moving in, in Galilee, you know, ministering to the needs of the people. He wasn't for the most part located where the central power was. That's very insightful for me, you know, that Jesus didn't do much. Uh, in those areas in Judea. Of course, he's going to die in Jerusalem, but a lot of his ministry was done in these poor areas of Galilee, ministering to the needs of people. So, uh, so there is a feast, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, what's happening? Uh, there is this place that is important for us to, uh, to, to, to have that information because John wants to make sure that you understand that this story, it really happened. So he gives us the location and the circumstance and everything. This is not something that was created by John. It really happened. So uh, there is this place uh, called uh, Bethesda. And what is what it is? It's, it's a pool that is located by, this, uh, by one of the gates, the sheep gate. Now the Jews, they will uh, keep the sheep that were prepared for the sacrifices in the temple outside the walls and near to this gate. And when there was the time for the sacrifice, they will bring the sheep through the gate and probably wash the sheep in the same pool. So you can imagine what kind of pool is that now. So they're bringing the sheep in there, and Jesus comes probably through that pool, uh, through that uh, gate. I'm sorry. Uh, I, it's just me, but I'm thinking that every time Jesus saw the sheep that will be sacrificed, he will think about his own destiny and saying, I am the Lamb of God. I'm going to die for them. So Jesus comes and, and goes to this place, a specific corner in the city of Jerusalem when there is this, this pool. Now, Bethesda means house of mercy or place of mercy. It's a great place for Jesus to go, right? <laughs> place of mercy or house of mercy. But it wasn't really a house of mercy. I think by reading the story, this was a house of misery. That's what it was. You know, and uh, it kind of gives us the description. I don't want to go into all the details. You can look at it, you know, for, for many years, you know, those skeptics, they will criticize this story because they were not, nobody was able to find this pool in Jerusalem until a few years back. It was finally discovered, and there is a pool. It's a double pool. It has five porches. The whole thing fits the narrative. So it's true. That place was there. And it seems uh, that at the times of Jesus was filled with two to three feet of water and it was being fed by spring water uh, uh, that will come into the city. So we know a little bit of it, but you can read and there is great videos that shows you all the details. 
So we have the occasion, we have the location. Now let's see what's going on in this scenario. In verse 3 tells us that there's this great multitude of sick people. Uh, some of them are blind, some of them are lame, paralyzed, and they are there for a reason. They are waiting for a miracle. Uh, so we don't know how many is a great multitude, but if there was a feast, this was amplified by a lot of people. 300 people, 400, 500. We don't know, but probably they cannot even move because everybody's so close together and they have all kinds of sickness. Some of them contagious, probably. I don't know. But can you picture that? I think Jesus coming to this play is kind of like surveying the hopeless of people. You know, you've seen this multitude of people that don't know what to do anymore. They're broken. There's no system that works for them. There's no hospitals they can go. There's no emergency rooms. If you have complained one day by going to the emergency room and having to wait for a couple of hours, they were waiting their whole life right there. And I have complained, I admit, so don't look at me like saying, you, you don't, no, I do. You know, I remember recently I went to an emergency room bringing a friend of mine from Peru who had an emergency. Now let's go to the emergency, and he was sitting in the emergency, and he was all concerned, no, they're not going to see me. They saw him pretty quick. You know, it was like half hour. I was like, wow, this is good. And then he came out, and after he came out, he told me, this is unbelievable, unbelievable. What is unbelievable? They, they just saw me. What do you mean they saw? Yeah, they just, they were nice, and they saw everything, and what do you mean? Well, if, in Peru, where I live, you go to a place like that, good luck. A couple of days or three days, and people are sleeping on the parking lot, waiting to be seen. So, wow, so we are so blessed, really. We're so blessed. We can complain a lot, but we are blessed beyond measure when we compare ourselves with the rest of the world. And, and God has been good to us for so long time. And our fear now is that we are turning our backs to him, and God might remove his blessings or part of them to get our attention back to him. But we see this, you know, there is this crowd of people, um, and they are sick. And what are they doing? Well, they are waiting. So this is a waiting room. See what I was talking about waiting? <laughs> it's a waiting room. And what is what they are waiting for, the doctor? No, for a miracle. Have you waited for a miracle in your life? I have. <laughs> just praying and praying and praying and praying, Lord, when are you going to do it? And just waiting, and, and the waiting time is the worst. So these people are waiting for the moving of the waters. What's going on here? Well, in verse 4, it tells us that there was this story. Uh, of, we don't know if it's true or not, really. I read several interpretations of this. But the story basically is that an angel of heaven will come a certain time. Certain time. They don't know what time. He will come and stir up the water. And once that happens, you need to get in the pool. Because the first person that will step in will get healed. That was the belief. That was the belief. Now, I, as I said, you know, you have read probably, and you said, wow, that's superstition and all that. Probably it was, right? But what I see is a Jesus that doesn't affirm it, but he doesn't deny it neither. You know, I don't know. I don't know how God works. Probably it was a superstition. Probably I'm thinking if what they discovered recently that there was a spring, uh, water spring coming from underneath, probably at the time we will bubble up, you know, people assign that supernaturally to an angel and said, oh, it's an angel. And I know that because when people have no hope and they are really hopeless, they are willing to believe whatever. I've seen that in my country. I've seen that in other places. They assign powers to anything. They assign powers to a place, to a person, to something, because they know maybe through this I will get the miracle that I'm looking for. You know, it's well known and documented that sometimes there is a tree there, and there is kind of like, you know, a little weird figure in the tree, and people think, oh, that's an apparition, that's something crazy, and then they go and worship the tree and touch the tree, and then there is a multitude, you know, around the tree just praying for a miracle. Also, growing up in, 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 in Lima, I remember my mom uh, taking us to a big procession. You know, those processions where they take, you know, the supposedly Jesus image and they walk through and they make prayers. I, I will never forget that experience because people were on their knees just dragging themselves blocks and blocks 
just waiting for the miracle and touching the thing and thinking that's the miracle. And they will all wear these purple robes and there was incense. It was very dramatic and traumatic. I don't know how people will take kids to those things. But I was there and I was like, wow, God, this is crazy. You know, what a distortion of God. What a distortion, and it's so sad. But people really have faith. They want to place their faith in something more than the material. And we might be so sophisticated and say, oh, it's superstition. Yeah, but that's all they have. And we need to bring them to Jesus. So anyway, uh, this crowd is packed with sick, sick people, and they are waiting for this miracle, the steering of the waters. So what was Jesus doing this? Let's bring Jesus into the picture. Why will he go to a place like that? Why he didn't go straight to the temple? You know, and, and that's the thing, and one of the main, my main points here is that Jesus came to the house of mercy to show mercy. To show mercy, because that's our Jesus. To show mercy. You remember in Matthew 9, 12 and 13, uh, you might have that verse on the screen. Jesus said to a bunch of people that were criticizing him because he was healing with sinners, those who are well have no need of a, phys of a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what that means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I desire mercy and no sacrifice. And that particular verse is applicable to the uh, spiritual state of the heart, but also I understand on the physical. Jesus goes to a place, it's called place of mercy, but he knows it's a place of disgrace. And he goes there to show what true mercy is all about. And he's going to do it. And uh, maybe I'm going ahead of this, but mercy comes along with truth. They both are part of the same thing. Anyway, Jesus goes there. And because he has come to, you know, to seek and save the, what, that which was lost. And these guys were lost, and specifically this guy. So, okay, they are waiting there. Now, uh, the story of the angel, by the way, you might know, because in your Bibles you have a little note under. And some of you might be thinking, Caesar, you're missing that right now. That verse 4 uh, is not found in the earliest manuscript of the, group, uh, the Gospel of John. It seems like chapter, verse 4 was added later on by probably a scribe who felt that he needed to explain the situation better because of what, what's going to happen in verses 7 and 8. That's, that's what I came to learn, okay? So if you are like, okay, maybe it did, maybe it didn't happen. Um, so we don't know. But people had their faith into that event. So now we have the picture, right? We have the scenario. We know the place. We know the crowd is ready to jump into the water. They don't know. They are waiting there hours and hours. There is food all over the place. And, you know, there is a crowd of people. Uh, the smell must be terrible, probably. I'm thinking, just picturing in my mind. You know, there's humidity and people are very close to each other. It's, it's a picture of humanity. That's how Jesus found us. Maybe you were not in that place. But when Jesus descended from heaven and came to us, this, this is not a nice place. We didn't make it a nice place. And Jesus has to come and live with sinners and put up with a lot of stuff because he loves us and he wants to show mercy to us and show us the way back to the Father. So now we have the encounter in verses 5 through 9. In verses 5 to 9, we have the encounter of Jesus with this man. It tells us that it's a certain man who was there and he has been sick for 38 years. A certain man. We don't know the name. We don't know his name. We don't know his identity. We don't know who he is. We know that he didn't have any relationship to Jesus because he didn't know Jesus at all. So we might say that he didn't have faith in Jesus. So this is not a story of faith. It's just a story of mercy. That's what it is. And we know his condition. He's been sick for 38 years and he got to the point that he wasn't able to walk or move without help. Uh, I remember, again, you know, going back to my childhood in Peru, seeing people like that on the streets. It's very sad that you see that here now. It's so sad for me, because um, I grew up seeing that. And I grew up um, in, 
seen so much of that that my heart was cold toward that people because you see it everywhere. And you question what are the motivations of people by doing that. Um, so it's been sad for my wife and for, I to, and for myself to see what's happening in our cities here in America and seeing people on the streets and begging. You don't know if they are real or not. And you struggle and you don't know if they're going to buy drugs or what they're going to do. And you, you struggle, right? And still, we, I think we need to find ways to show compassion and mercy. I don't know how that applies to you. Maybe, you know, put together, you know, some packages with some stuff to give to people if you don't want to give money or something. Or maybe talk to them. I don't know. It's hard, I know. But this person has been sick for 38 years. And I think that after 38 years, you make a living out of the situation. That's the way you live your life. So probably that's the way he makes money. That's the way he does things. He does no other option. He is stuck. It's a person that is stuck. So probably he settled for his condition. And he was there for the same reason that everybody was there. To get a miracle from God. Uh, but the rest of the story is going to tell us that he wasn't just in physical bondage. He was also in a spiritual bondage. And you see, when Jesus ministered to a person, he ministers to the physical, but he sees the soul. And many times both of them are interconnected. But he's interested in the soul because flesh and blood want to inherit the kingdom of heaven. We can get all the healing we want, but if we don't get right with Jesus, what's good for? So we see that. And... Uh, Jesus, it tells us that Jesus saw him, saw him lying there. And that's very, very um, insightful for me. Because I told you this is a story of compassion. Verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition for a long time, for 38 years. Number one, Jesus knows. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Jesus knows. What is what I'm saying? He knows everything. And he doesn't miss any detail of our lives. He knows everything that we have been through, we're going to go through, or we are going through right now. He knows everything. He knows. And the scripture tells us that he saw him lying there. And that's another point that I want to like to share with you. Because just learning that compassion it's always that it's something that always starts but how you look at people. Jesus saw him lying there. Everything starts by how you look at people. You know, you remember the story of Jesus feeding the multitude, of course. We saw last a couple of weeks ago. And in Mark tells us that when Jesus saw the multitude that were following him, he was moved with compassion for them because they were like what? Like sheep, no having a shepherd. Everything starts how you see people. That's compassion. The disciples, they saw this multitude like annoying. Send them away, Lord. But Jesus saw him as a sheep that has no shepherd. So no, you, we're going to help them. So compassion starts how you, you see people. What about the prodigal son story? Remember? The prodigal son runs away, spends all the money, and then he realizes... I made a mistake. <laughs> I need to come back to my father's house. He might give you a little, little corner there. I don't care. But I'm going to be better than where I am right now. And then he's thinking the father is going to be upset with him. But the scripture tells us that when he saw him, when the father saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went and kissed him and, and all that. You know the story. It's how you see people. The father could have seen the prodigal son like somebody that doesn't deserve anything, and he will be okay. He said, no, no, you, you are out, sorry. But he saw him with compassion. So just learning through this story is that compassion starts in the way you see people. What about Jonah? Jonah is another great example to me. I learned so much in the book of Jonah. It's a great book, right, to tell the kids especially. They are excited about the, the fish part and all that. But Jonah, the Lord tells him, Jonah, go and preach this message of judgment that is coming upon Nineveh. And you know, Jonah didn't want to do it. You know why? Because for Jonah, they were a bunch of pagans. 
These pagan people, they don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve. I know what you're going to do, God. You're going to have me going over there, and then you're going to have mercy of them. And that's exactly what happened in Jonah 4, 2. He says, so he prayed to the Lord and said, Jonah is complaining after the Lord, you know, stopped the judgment because they repented. And they said, ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are gracious and merciful, God, slow to anger and abandoning in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. So he was angry at God because had God had mercy on them, and he knew that that might happen. But for him, they were pagans. They were away from God. They deserved the punishment of God. They were perverts. They were sexually immoral. All the stuff. And by the way, I see a lot of that in our days. But Jesus was moved with compassion. And you know what happened at the end in the book of Jonah when the Lord you know, makes deal with Jonah, and in verse 11, he says, and I should not have pity of Nineveh, that great city, that pagan city that you're talking about, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left. So Jonah saw the 120,000 pagans. That's what he saw. But God saw 120,000 people that couldn't discern from right to left. He saw him blind, but Jonah saw him condemned. How are we going to see this world? I mean, most of the people out there, they're, they're blind. I hope, I mean, I'm not saying that we have this enlightenment or anything like that, but if you are following Jesus, you have the light of the world. Your eye has been opened. Maybe you know what enough. And that's what I'm kind of questioning about myself. Am I really looking what's happening around me or... Or I'm so much into the world that I don't understand. But the Lord told Jonah, I, I see a totally different thing. I don't see like left, right. I just see people and, and I see souls. And, and they, need, they need me. And that's basically mercy. Mercy starts in how you see people. So now you go home and look at your neighbor and say hi. <laughs> you know, you are in the, in the freeway and look at people driving crazy around you in a different way. Okay, can you do that? I'm going to do my best, I promise, okay? <laughs> but it starts how you see, how you see people. So now it comes into the dialogue, you know, Jesus and this certain man that has been waiting there for 38 years. And Jesus asked him a question that in my sense like insensitive, you know, and rude. Jesus tells him, do you want to be made well? Straight up question. I love that from Jesus because he doesn't waste time. Hey, my name is Jesus, and, you know, I've been here for a few years. And no, no, no. He doesn't need to do that. When God speaks to you, he, you know, forget about the courtesy. He just goes straight to your heart. And the question, take this man by surprise. Thought, you wouldn't be surprised? You will say, what? First of all, who are you? <laughs> he doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't have any faith other than, you know, the angel you know, that will stir up the water. Do you want to be made well? Very intriguing, but the Lord knows this guy. And when you know someone, you know how to talk to that person, right? When you know your son, you know your daughter, you know how to talk to them. You don't need all the, uh, you know, curves and corners. You just go and talk to them. And I think that's a, that's a sign of love. Jesus is loving this guy by going straight to the question. Do you want to be made well? It was brief, it was straight, and it was... To the point, uh, by the answer of this man, he wasn't like upset by the question, you know. But here's the thing that I think that question was revealing his heart. Do you really want to be made well? Are you serious about this or is it just that? Because, you know, I mean, I have been questioning my prayer life sometimes, you know. And I pray for things and then I question myself, do I really want this to happen? <laughs> do I really want the Lord to work on my marriage? Do, do, do I know what it takes? Do I want the Lord to fix the relationship? Do, you want, do I want the Lord? Am I praying with a heart full of faith or just saying things? Because it sounds good. And I think a lot of people, maybe we fall into that, you know. And the Lord has to tell us, are you, are you, do you understand what you're asking? Do you, do you want to be made well? 
Because it might take a few changes. It might take some things. So you have to understand. And he's questioning him because probably this guy wasn't even interested in the healing anymore. He was probably saying, it's my life, and this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, and I'm miserable. And he confronts him to start waking up in him. Uh, faith directed toward Jesus and not toward the water. So he's doing something there. And the man responds, and uh, the, the response, uh, we, we have it here, in, in, um, let me see here. Yeah, sir, verse 7, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. So he starts playing his struggles, you know, to Jesus, like Jesus didn't know, right? Jesus knows exactly what's happening. Uh, and, and here's the thing, you know, that a lot of people are trapped into a system, I believe. So this man is trying to explain the system to him. Jesus, let me explain to you how the system works, okay? You first go make an appointment. Isn't that the system works here for us. We are so used to that. You know, make a phone call, make an appointment. You know, then you have to get a ride. Then you have to wait. Then you have to sign this paper. There's a system. And we are a part of the system. I don't say that we don't do it. But this guy has his own system. He's this, let me explain the system, okay? First of all, you have to be present. You have to come. Okay, you have to push your way into the first row, very close to the water. That's the system. There's no exemptions. You have to be there. You cannot do that for long distance. You have to be there. Now, second rule, only one person can be healed at a time. That's the system. Only one person. The first in touching the water after the angel stir up the water, that's the winner. And that's the system. That's how it works, Jesus. And what happened is that the system works against me because I have nobody to help me to put me in the water. And I don't know, but if you feel like that sometimes, I talk to people outside and I feel that people feel trapped in this life. And sometimes they are thinking the system is not working for me. I do everything that I have to do and it's still empty. What's going on? Maybe I have to come out of, out of the system and living in a different life. And you know, the problem is not the system, the problem is your heart, it's inside here. You will never be satisfied until you drink of the water that Jesus gives us. And that's when you start feeling peace and you can deal with all kinds of systems around us. But he was explaining it to Jesus I have no one to put me in the pool. So this is no working for me, but I'm okay with it. So you see, when you settle for that, it's just what it is. It's never going to change. Let's just do this one more day. And then you woke up on Monday. This is, that's what it is. I don't think so. I think God wants to speak to us. He wants to wake us up. That it's true that we live in this world. But Jesus said those who believe in him... Out of their heart, there will be rivers of living life. Uh, living life, right. Abundant life, I'm sorry. In other words, the Spirit will produce this kind of life that the world haven't experienced yet, and, and they will be like a fountain. People will see that there is something different outside the system. It's the kingdom of heaven, and that this is just a temporary passing. And Jesus speaks to him, and the man answered him, you know, I have no help. I'm trapped. That's what I am. Now the miracle. Are you ready? I love the miracle. You like the miracles? <laughs> I love them. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. So you mean Jesus isn't doing a healing crusade right there? No. You mean Jesus didn't raise his voice and, you know, rebuke the devil? No. They just talk to him and say, hey, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Three things. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. Now, I've been thinking about this because this guy didn't have any faith. He didn't know who Jesus is. So this is a story of pure mercy. That's what it is. And God can do it for anybody. It's that, I don't know, it's in the sovereignty of God to do this. But look at this. The rise part wasn't a... Hey, you know, let me help you. It was a commandment. Rice. It was a commandment. And uh, it's just trying to find something there for us because I believe that many times God will ask us for impossible commandments. No, I cannot do that. I cannot rise. You see my reality? Impossible commandments. 
Moses was asked for an impossible commandment. Go and speak to Pharaoh. Uh, you? Me? No way. I'm not going. I cannot do that. You're going to kill me there, and I don't even know how to speak. It's an impossible commandment. You remember the story, right? It's impossible. What are you asking me to do? What about Jesus and Peter? Jesus, Peter, come out of the boat. Sorry. I'm a fisherman. I know what's going to happen. This time I put my step of foot out of the boat. I'm going to go down. It's an impossible commandment. So there's impossible commandments in our lives. But here's the thing with Jesus. Whenever Jesus gives us an impossible commandment, he also enables us and gives us the power to do it. I believe that. You don't have it on you. Believe me, I try. I don't have it on me. When I have to do something that I think I, I won't be able to do this, 100% of the times, I'm right. I'm not able. <laughs> but then I look down and look back and say, Lord, you did it. Whenever he gives you an impossible commandment, he will strengthen you and give you the power to fulfill it, to obey it. It's up to us now. So there is a commandment. But there is also the empowering of the word of God, because it's the word of God. What is what empowers us in this world? It's the word of God. That's where the power comes, and through the spirit, the word of God and the spirit. We saw that a couple of weeks ago. The word of God and the spirit empowers you to do the impossible commandment to, to follow Jesus. Um, well, we have Moses, we have Peter. But then Jesus tells uh, the man, take up your bed. And I was wondering, why do you have to say, take up your bed, you know? At the end of the day, taking up the bed is going to get Jesus in trouble, because that's what the Pharisees are going to see. Hey, what are you doing walking with that bed? Over here. That's not right. That's not lawful. It's the Sabbath. But Jesus went ahead and did not take up your bed, because the bed is going to become a testimony, right? Of what this guy's life was before, and what is he going to be forward? Before he was laying in that bed, now he takes it with him. He doesn't need it anymore. And I, I love that picture. You know, I, a couple of years ago, I met this pastor um, from Mexico. I met him in a camp here. And he shared his testimony. And his testimony was very dramatic. He got into drugs very deep. And he lost everything. He lost everything you can lose. He was reduced to nothing. Ended up living under a bridge under the river Tijuana. Tijuana River, when you go into TJ, go through that bridge you see under there, it's hell under there. That's what it is. And he was there. He was living there. And he was sleeping, he was sleeping inside the, cre- the, the trash can. Inside. That was his house. From there, the Lord pulled him out. Somebody came down and preached the gospel to these people. And he believed. Compassion, right? How do you see people? This guy is so not a bunch of undesirable people. He saw souls. And he went down there and preached the gospel, and one of them came to the Lord. So he was giving his testimony for us, and he had this pair of shoes with him, and they were tennis shoes, and they were the ugliest tennis shoes you can see ever. Holes everywhere, ripped. I mean, they were terrible. Are these shoes? And he told us that these are the shoes that he was wearing when the Lord found him. And now wherever he goes, he tells the story, and he said, this is what I was. What a, what a graphic thing. And now Jesus is telling this guy, pick up your bed, take it everywhere. Let everybody know that you were laying in that bed, but I heal you now. Imagine, do you have those things in your life? Remember? Things that you were attached to or in bondage to, and now you're free from those? I'm not taking you, I'm not asking you to take them with you, but remember. Remember what the Lord has done for you. Don't be so ungrateful, because ungratefulness is a bad thing. Just remember what God has done for you in the past. That also helps you how you see people in the present. I remember I asked a pastor that I respect a lot in my life. um, We were doing some ministry in Mexico, and I saw a lot of compassion in his actions to our people, poor people, right? And I was very touched by his compassion, and and we were eating lunch at a McDonald's. And, uh, and, and I said, how do you do this? How do you do this? I don't know. I, how do you express that compassion? And basically he said to me, well, I never, remember, I never forget where the, Lord, where the Lord rescued me from. I never forget that. I was lost. So when I see somebody that is lost, I feel this compassion. It's the Holy Spirit that gives me the compassion. So it's not your compassion. It's the Holy Spirit's compassion that 
puts it in you, but you have to remember. So the Lord works in you. So let's, uh, let's kind of like finish the story. So the miracle happens, take up your bed and walk. Now there was a problem. What was the problem? It was done in the wrong day or was the right day. But <laughs> probably, you know, the disciples are like, Jesus, you are doing it on a Saturday again. Why don't you do it on a Friday or Thursday or Monday? Why you do it on a Saturday? This is going to get us in trouble with all these people. <laughs> Why you do it on a Saturday, Jesus? This is Sabbath. And then the Jews, therefore, verse 10, said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he, asked, he answered them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? These people were more interested in who said to this guy to walk than who is the guy who healed him. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's the core of legalism. You know, when somebody's into legalism and, you know, it's, sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's not. I don't know. I don't want to do too much of this. But for the most part, legalistic people are more concerned about what is not being done. Um, what is not being done rather than the good that is being done. So, you know, just why don't you do it this way, this way, this way, this way? Why don't you focus on what God is doing? Is he doing good? Okay, that's good then. So maybe we need to reevaluate all these things. You know, what's happening with the Sabbath? You might say that Jesus was breaking the law. Jesus was not breaking the law. I don't have a lot of time to see into that, but the commandment uh, will not forbid people to do good in that day, and that's what Jesus will say. It was about customary work. In other words, you couldn't, you couldn't go to your office, you couldn't go to your shop, you couldn't take a, a car for fun, go to the movies, nothing of that. But the commandment was never intended to stop good from being done when there was needs. And Jesus will, you know, fight for this because that's how rigid sometimes we are. Now, they were so concerned about the Sabbath, these uh, people, the rulers, the religious establishment, that they created additional prescriptions or laws um, to the law of the Sabbath. And at least, for what I read, there was 39 more laws concerning the Sabbath. One of them was specifically about carrying your bed. That was one. So let me see, um, page four, article three, incision B, you cannot carry your bed, wrong. That's who they were. They codified everything. And a lot of people want to codify the work, the work of God and the work of the Spirit. We cannot do that. Oh, it has to be that way because my church always did it like that. Well, who is the head of the church? Is it Jesus? Maybe he wants us to change a little bit on here and there in order to reach out the world. He wants to do it. So, and, and I see this in these people. They were concerned about their own interpretation of the law. In other words, they make the day, the day of rest no restful. Because <laughs> you were, oh, maybe, maybe I violated the law. I picked out my wallet from the floor. I'm done. I cannot go to church now. You know, stuff like that. You know, you, it was so heavy. Now, they were not interested in the healing. They were interested in the breaking of their commandments. Verse 14, after Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sing no more, lest a word thing comes upon you. Uh, this first two, we need, we need to be careful, but we also we need to be truthful on this. Because Jesus is about to speak truth into this man. And maybe that's the last point that I want to make. Mercy and truth. They have to come together. It's not just about mercy, 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 and never speaking the truth. And Jesus is going to speak the truth to this guy like never, nobody else has done it, I believe. I don't think anybody talked to this guy straight up like Jesus did. And sometimes that's exactly what we need. Somebody to speak to us straight up. This is wrong. Uh, who are you? Why are you telling me this? Nobody has told me that before. It's for your good. You know why? Because Jesus loves this guy. He loves this man. Has been sick for 38 years. He knows his story. And he's the good physician. He's 
not just healing the body. He's healing the soul. That's what he wants to do. And he spoke the truth. He says, see, you have been made well. The way it's phrasing in the grammatical, you know, uh, part of the sentence means that the healing was permanent. It wasn't that, like the healing that we get these days. You go to the doctor and then a few pills and everything, treatment, and then you feel good and you're good. But then two years later, you're in the same spot, right? It comes back. That's part of our, you know, the breaking of our bodies. It's just natural, you know? Now, the healing that he received was permanent. In other words, you're healed. It's pure mercy. You haven't done anything. As a matter of fact, everything you've done is wrong. <laughs> but you're healed. Okay? So that will be the end of the story. Just go and do your life. It's not the end of the story. And that's the last point. He says, see. In other words, think about it now. You have been made well. It's pure mercy. And you are permanently healed. But now, sing no more. Sing no more. A lot of people would like to erase that part of the verse. Oh, why Jesus has to speak about sin? Oh, it was so nice, the story. But now he's speaking about sin. Oh, man. Sing no more, lest a worse thing comes upon you. And I'm thinking, what is a worse thing than being in bed for 30 years? Years? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think there is anything worse. Well, what about hell? What about losing your soul? That's a possibility, and a very real one. I mean, not talking about fear. We, in this body of believers, we believe in Jesus. If you don't believe in Jesus, you haven't accepted him into your heart, you haven't confessed your sins to him, do it. Because it's pure mercy. You don't need to perform in order to get forgiven. Just give it to him, and he will forgive you and cleanse you, and you will, you will have a new relationship with God. Right? So, but he's saying something worse might happen, to you. We don't know specifically what sin this guy committed, and we cannot say neither that every sickness is consequence of sin. That's not right theology. It's not biblical. We see a lot of sins, a lot of healings happening in the life of Jesus, and there's even one that, you know, a man that was born blind from, you know, from birth, you know, and, and the disciple says, who sinned? You know, his father or who? You know, that this guy has been blind from birth, and Jesus said, nobody. <laughs> so it's not right theology when some, in some Christian circles they start thinking that sickness is always related to sin. I reject that, and you should. But there is a possibility that something is happening in somebody's heart. Yes, Jesus also opens the door to that. I want to think maybe it was just that before he was sick, he was living in a very dissipated way, dissipation of life. I mean, if somebody, you know, gets into the habit of start drinking alcohol and then after the social thing, it becomes a habit and then you develop an addiction and then sooner or late, it's going to cut up with us. And you're sinning against your body by doing that. And do you see the relationship? Or it can be somebody living in a very disorderly way, you know, and cheating and, you know, immorality and all that might have an impact in their own bodies. And Jesus we, doesn't explain, us, explain to us what it was, but Jesus said, hey, here's the problem, man. I got to touch it. I'm sorry. But you have to stop doing what you're doing. Stop it. It's going to hurt you. So Jesus is loving the guy. He's not judging the guy. He's loving the guy, and he's bringing truth into mercy. And that's the whole picture, mercy and truth. Stop it. Because if you keep on this road again, you feel good now, you are healed, and then you go back to the same thing, you end up, you're going to end up in a worse place. And hopefully it's not the place that we just mentioned. But sadly, a lot of people won't listen, and they will end up in that place. And we don't have to. Nobody has to. Because the gospel is for everybody. You know, and Jesus is willing to take us, no matter how low we are, and to forgive us. So sing no more, lest a word thing happen or comes upon upon you uh, so Jesus was healing but he was talking about eternity now because what is healing without eternity no much really maybe a little bit of better conditions here but what about eternity I just wrote this for you to read it to you love someone enough love someone enough to tell him the truth I want that in my own life 
somebody that says, love me, tell me the truth, because that's part of love. And that's the only way we can start changing. So the most compassionate thing, just to wrap it up right now, the most compassionate things that we can do for someone, really, uh, that we love is, is to share Jesus with that person and the truth that comes with Jesus. After this event, you know, things are going to get very heated with Jesus because uh, if you read the context of the story, this man departed from, from, from there and he went straight to the Jews and he told him, it was Jesus, it was Jesus. Why would he do that, you know? And, and uh, it tells us that for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he has done these things on the Sabbath. So Jesus gained a few, not a few, but a lot of very powerful enemies by showing mercy. Maybe that's the price to pay to show mercy. I don't know. But Jesus gained that. He showed mercy, and he was judged by that because he did it on the Sabbath. And from now, from that point, Jesus is going to be persecuted. Persecuted. Somebody was asking me about persecution the other day. Do you think we're going to be persecuted? So I'm not a prophet. I don't know. <laughs> but the way things are going, I just want to say this, you know. Just do the ministry of Jesus. Be compassionate. Be loving. Be ready. You know, see people in a different way. If you just see people for what they are right now, you're going to get very frustrated. But ask God to change your, your, your eyesight. How do you see people? You know, when you go to an emergency room, you're sitting there and you see a picture of, you know, the breaking of humanity. You seen that? You, you go into an emergency room, and especially if you are going with someone, you are not in pain, but you are there and you kind of look around, and it's, it's so sad. You see the anguish, and you see the mom whose son is overdosed, is crying right there, and you see uh, the parents that are rushing in because their son has been rushed into the ER for an accident and might die, and you see all that, you know, and, and you look around and you see the drama of humanity, you know. But maybe those are the places, not necessarily ER, but places that we can be light and show compassion and maybe say, can I pray for you? Pray for your son. You know, people are waiting for that. In another circumstance, probably you wouldn't even talk to that person because he's different than me. Whether this is political or religiously or whatever. But start looking at people like Jesus sees people, you know, and show mercy and compassion. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your word of this morning and the story, Lord, that we had before us. Lord, we... Uh, we pray, Lord, um, that the Holy Spirit would bring this word, Lord, and uh, if there are things that we need to change in our lives, maybe it's the way we see people, I don't know, and I confess that sometimes I fall into that, Lord, things that have to be rectified, change us, Father, help us to see others like you see them, Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you will break any bondage to sin to in our lives so that we may live completely for you, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for the healing of this world, especially if people around us, not just physically, but spiritually, Lord. There is so much pain in this world right now. Jesus, we want to be like you. That's what we want. We certainly want to be like you, Jesus. But sometimes we feel so, so far but, Lord, thank you for being so patient and so gracious to us and giving us so many opportunities, Lord, to rectify it. So we pray, Lord, that your mercy will accompany, accompany us. Your mercy will go before us this week, Lord. But as your mercy goes before us, we pray, Father, that you will use us, use us as tools of mercy, as your vessels to show mercy to others that need to be shown mercy. And if there is any person here that needs prayer for healing, can you raise your hand where you are? Anybody? I see some hands. I see some hands. Physical healing. Let's pray together, Lord Jesus, by the grace of your son, Jesus. Lord, we just pray for these people. Lord, as you touch this man, will you touch them too, Lord, and bring relief to their bodies and healing, physical healing to them. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen.